Hello, everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Rita Udina, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director of ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Rita Udina is a paper and book conservator based in Barcelona, Spain, which is a private conservation lab where she works for the archives, museums, libraries, and the private collectors since 1999. She teaches and organizes international conservation courses at her studio, as well as in other countries and with, the inst with other institutions. She does lectures, research, and short collaborations with paper conservators from other countries as well. Some of these are Restor Restorator in the Netherlands, Institute National de Patrimony in Paris, Force from Belgium, Atelier Pour de Papier in Switzerland, University de Granada. She enjoys sharing conservation issues in conferences, papers, or on social media, particularly with her blog, ritaudina.com, which has followers from all over the world. Thank you, Rita, for today's talk, for agreeing for today's talk. The title for today's talk is Reversibility in Book and Paper Conservation. What is damage? Should restoration be nice? How compelling is reversibility in restoration? How much attention do we have for what a document went through? Can we establish a protocol to set this criteria with a standard general rule? These and similar questions sound familiar to anyone who has to do with paper heritage. Answers, however, are less evident. Restorers, collection owners, and researchers approach conservation and restoration from their own subject-oriented point of view, and this sometimes leads to conflict. So before I invite Rita Udina to answer a few of these questions, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please do type in your name, organization name, and email ID in the chat box. Please type in your questions also. We'll take those right at the end of the talk. So I now invite Rita. Over to you, Rita. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot, Padma, for your kind uh, introduction. And congratulations for these uh, fantastic talks that, uh, that you are giving. So this lecture that I will give today, uh, it's one I did in 2018 in the Chorus Symposium in Belgium. So I want to thank uh, Sintra Vest first for giving me the opportunity to cover this uh, challenging issue of uh, reversibility. I... <laughs> okay. So reversibility is a most controversial topic and we will see it first from different uh, approaches. The chemical and physical phenomenon, theoretical issues, terminology. And once we have seen all these approaches, we will see three different study cases in which the uh, conservation treatment uh, had to be, to be reverted. And at the end, uh, I will do some conclusions to, to the whole thing. Conservation and reversibility. When I first uh, start uh, my first research on, on this, I found a book speaking solely about conservation. And guess what the title is? Reversibility. Does it exist? But if the title is not discouraging enough, when we read at the subtitles, it's even worse because they speak about myth, about ideal, about illusion, or even a ghost. So if any of you is still hesitating on what the answer is, does reversibility really exist? I will reply for you. And no, it does not exist. Let's look at it from a purely scientific point of view. If we uh, go to thermodynamics, 
The definition is a process that after it has taken place can be reversed and when reversed turns the system as the initial state. Thermodynamics all also states that perfectly reversible processes do not exist. Is it possible then that conservators intend our conservation treatments to go beyond the possibilities of physics? Because in spite of being unrealistic, we all claim our conservation treatment to be reversible. And I will give you a really clear example. Most of us use uh, starch paste, but, uh, and we say, yeah, yeah, because it's, it's reversible. But if uh, we point at the solubility phenomena, because we are now on the thermodynamics and physical uh, point of view, only 10% of starch paste is soluble in water. So the 90% remnant remains not soluble in case we need it to remove it. And still we use it. Why? Because it's really easy to scrape off. We can easily remove a uh, amend that we did with, uh, with the starch paste. <laughs> it's also easy to add some moisture and remove uh, whatever starch paste we put. And this 90 to 70% remnant remaining on the object is unobtrusive and innocuous. It means that yes, it's there, we did not remove that 90%, but it does not do any damage and it allows us to do further treatments if necessary. Since uh, we cannot beat physics, let's see if we have better luck with metaphysics. Reversibility means uh, turning back to a, an initial state. But when exactly? Umberto Baldini covers this uh, theory issues and he uh, establishes three different stages of the object, the creation, the lifetime, and the conservation treatment. It seems reasonable then to leave untouched whatever comes from the first stage of, of, the, of the lifetime of the object, which is creation. And here I have uh, this example of a manuscript from the Library of the Architects Association of Barcelona. And when doing the surface cleaning of this manuscript, I found a sewing needle and some pounds, which is this finely ground powder used as a blotter to prevent the inks from bleeding. So if we want to keep an evidence of this previous stage or, or the moment of creation of the object is as easy as just uh, keep it on a bag and then go ahead with other conservation treatments that might uh, remove this, these aspects. But we know it's never as easy as that. I have here this other example that is an architectural drawing from the archive uh, from Errenteria, a town in the Basque country in Spain. And this is an impregnated tracing paper plan. As you know, uh, impregnated tracing paper is a paper that was soaked in oil in order to make it translucent. And that was done previous to do any drawing on it. So shouldn't I be allowed, well, and this oil uh, causes extreme brittleness on the paper, oxidation, acidification, well, it's a real nightmare. So shouldn't I be allowed to remove this varnish? 
because it belongs to a previous stage from creation? I don't think so. I don't think um, in which order <laughs> of the lifetime, uh, whatever happened of the object has uh, particular priorities. So I removed the varnish and, and did the, the conservation treatment without the varnish, because in my opinion, the benefits are much larger than leaving it as it was. And I can keep all that has an interest for me, the, the document, the drawing, uh, what, everything. Uh, Baldini focuses mainly on the second stage of the object. And uh, he doesn't, and, and he establishes some aspects that are positive and some aspects that are negative. But he doesn't give any uh, logical parameters for us to distinguish which one we should keep and which we should not. For instance, he speaks about the patina as a positive value of uh, whatever object and as dirt as a negative one that we should remove as opposite to patina. But uh, where does patina end and where, and where does dirt begin? Mm, there's no possible way to uh, establish this. It's a matter of of taste, if you want, of hue. So th there is no possible logical decision for this. And if, uh, if we go to historical events, uh, things become even more and more ambiguous. And here's the case of a Rothko painting that was in the Tate Modern. You might have heard of it. And a Russian artist uh, decided that he would add some inscription on it in 2012. And he claimed, because he was an artist, that he was improving, in fact, that painting. Tate Modern didn't uh, deem that uh, as an improvement, but rather as a defacing of the painting. And that's why they just decided to remove this, this scribal. So, if, uh, well, and of course, I mean, there are many other examples of things that uh, some would leave and some would uh, remove. If we cannot make a logical selection of what could be preserved from the past, how can we establish which of the present treatments should be more reversible than, than others? Because we said <laughs> that 100% reversibility does not exist. It's a subjective matter. No matter how we want to look at it, it's a matter of criteria. And I want to refer to a, a paper by Fletcher Durant who made the talk on the Econ Book and Paper uh, Lectures a few months ago. And the title is uh, already really clear. Conservation is not neutral and neither are we. I cannot agree more with him. I mean, whatever we do, it's our decision. I, okay, and here I have two examples of two non-reversible uh, conservation treatments. The first, of, uh, the first of them, the one on the left, it's a folio, uh, it's a parchment folio on a musical score. And uh, this is an old repair and it consists on tiny little holes along the tear to do a sewing. It's not not reversible because once I pin <laughs> the parchment with a hole, the hole remains there. But still, it's an excellent repair. It's a flexible mending, it causes no tension, the text is still readable, and in case it breaks, which uh, should be really rare because these mends are super endurable, but in case it breaks, 
it can be very easily uh, done again. You, we, you, we only need to replace uh, the sewing. So a fantastic conservation treatment that is not reversible. And the other example on the right, it's a, it's a manuscript from the Centre de Documentació del Palau de la Música in Barcelona. And it's a musical score that was very much damaged with uh, iron gullings. So uh, I don't need to explain further corrosion, uh, even if iron gulling or acidic corrosion, it's a real problem for conservators and there's no way to face it in a reversible way. Because if I want to stop uh, corrosion, and, and this corrosion is due to the inks, and these inks belong to the object. I mean, that's, that's the products they use. So if I want to keep everything, <laughs> I should need to keep the corrosion as well. But I do not. So, uh, and I include the acidification as well. So if we want to get rid of this acidity of, of this uh, ink corrosion, we apply treatments that are not reversible, but we don't really want to go back to the previous stage. We don't want, really want to have all the notes of the musical score flaking on the table. We want to be able to flip the pages and uh, we are not really seeking for reversibility in this case. It's always a matter of benefits and, and damages. So with this treatment that, as you can see, it has also been lined as a reinforcement, I lose some uh, contrast, but I gain in, uh, in being able to, to handle the document. And here's another example. And this is a, a work in progress. This is a book that uh, we are working on, on it right now. It belongs to the Regional Archive of uh, Terrassa in Barcelona. And it's a manuscript from the 16th century. And as you can see, it has uh, old repairs. These repairs that are attached, uh, pasted on the on the manuscript have some inscriptions and the inscriptions of the, of the repair on top reproduce what was uh, on the original folio. So, well, I mean, these repairs are really nice and interesting to me. There are other repairs that are more recent that I don't find as nice as and, and as interesting. And if the book were mine, I would not keep them, honestly. <laughs> but the book is not mine and I am a conservator. So if I decide that I keep all the old repairs, I keep all of them. But there is still another issue here because I have to choose on keeping the repairs or making the folio more stable. And here the, the arrows are pointing all the uh, creases and tensions that this nice and old repair is causing to the paper. So if I remove this, um, this repair, the, the text will remain uh, cut and not match because as you can see, the text was done with the repair um, on a wrinkled paper. But conservators have the privilege to have a sort of magic. <laughs> and we sometimes can go back and forth uh, in, in history as, as, as if uh, we were traveling in magic. And in this particular case, we succeeded in sort of sharing this possibility with the, well, the potential users of this manuscript. And this is what uh, we did. So this is the, well, the whole book is not finished yet, but yeah, the, repair, the repairs, yes, are done. So uh, we chose to keep 
the repairs without attaching them. First of all, because um, there was no way to attach them so that the letters matched uh, on top and below because they, they had never matched. And also because leaving the repair separated from the book, we could see how uh, perfectly reproduced the, the letters were done. So here we see the repairs and here the, the repairs, I mean, that you can flip as if it was a folio and you see at your left how similar the, the reproduction of the repair is. So, but all this that uh, I'm really satisfied with it, uh, well, and, and proud because we have been thinking of these repairs a lot <laughs> before doing this. It has an important drawback, and it's the fact that I am altering readability of the text because now I'm telling you that I chose to do this. But if I didn't tell you and you were looking at this book, you might not understand why do we have some repairs here? Um, I mean, if they if I see something attached on the paper, it's clear or sort of clear that it's a repair. But if it's not, I might not be able to um, deduct that that is a repair. So now, as Umberto Baldini suggested, this is the third stage. I'm adding another sort of information. So if I don't explain to the user what's the point of this, I'm sort of distorting this information. It's not as readable, although we can read more no? because we see the two texts. So as you can see, uh, physics mm, we really don't succeed in, <laughs> in relying on physics to say that we do reversible treatments. Theory, we don't match because we don't agree in which stages of time we should keep. And linguistics, maybe it's a matter of that. Maybe we should use another term that better uh, defines the boundaries of our profession. So you might have heard of, uh, apart from reversible, retreatable or removable. But in my opinion, it's not a matter of linguistics because conservation is much too complex to be pigeonholed by a single word. In my opinion, so it's not that if we do a very reversible or very retreatable or very removable treatment, we will do a good conservation treatment. No. In my opinion, we should uh, do a good conservation treatment seeking to make the object stable, functional, uh, functional, sorry, and readable. And by readable, I mean that when I see it, it has a consistency that the meaning, that whatever message is bringing that object, it's clear, it's not distorted. So it should be the other way. I do, I look for this and I do it the most reversible, the most retreatable and the most removable I can. When I do this, I mean, at the end, it's all a matter of decision making and I have to do a balance of benefits and damages, of course. And for this, I made a, well, I ha you have here this link of a blog post I made some time ago, and it has a never failing application. So this application is fantastic because you enter the data there, whether the object is unique or not, whether the damages are huge or low, whether it belongs to a type of collection or another, uh, so you enter all sorts of uh, data in there 
And then as a result, you get a super precise and exact uh, result of the type of conservation that you should apply. Do you believe that? No, <laughs> neither do I. The application is you. Conservators are the ones who do decision making. You are the application. So we have to decide at every moment at, for every object, every time. So there is no logical way that we establish that. Sorry. So now that uh, we see that uh, we are so much experts, so we don't succeed with physics, with theory, neither with linguistics. <laughs> but still, we will see these uh, three different study cases. First, uh, well, all of them belong to the Museum Alconcusi, which is in Mar Masnou, Barcelona. And it's a, it's a pharmacy collection, uh, amazing. And they have beautiful, uh, well, an amazing library with very interesting books. This book first, I thought it was, or it could be a lacquer binding because it, it is super, super, super glossy as you can see. But taking a closer look, I could see it's uh, no, no lacquer binding at all. The style really, no, I mean, no. <laughs> but it's a book that at some point had been varnished, deeply varnished. And uh, because of this varnish, you see this awkward uh, aperture of the binding. That's because the, the joints and the spine uh, have been, uh, have shrunk a bit, no? They lost the ability to, to swell. And that's why the covers remained open. So I just decided to remove the, the varnish. Just a second. Ay, podeu parlar dos bacets, us plau? Gràcies. So I just removed the varnish and the really nice gilding, uh, appears so it is uh, a reversible treatment but it doesn't mean that uh, it's good because it's reversible i mean this varnish was not doing any benefit at all it only had drawbacks and if we look at the um, uh, at the last page at the, at the page down of the book we see that there is a short condition report of the, of the conservator who applied the varnish. And I was really curious and hoping to find, uh, no, why, why the varnish? And uh, we can read, washed and restored by uh, the name. And some folios are missing at the end of the book and the date. So no mention about the varnish, but some mention about the washing. And in truth, although the book had never be, been disassembled, you see that the edges were red, uh, but not that red anymore. And that is because uh, they had been bleached. The edges of the, of the papers had been bleached uh, at some point. So, bueno, we don't have much information, but uh, <laughs> some. <laughs> Good. So this is the second study case. And this is a Dioscorides from the 16th century. It's a really nice book, a limp vellum binding. And uh, well, I guess you all notice that part of it is missing. And we also found a, a short condition report that says, dated today, all remnant of paper cancer, purple stain, has been eliminated. Bear in mind, in case this paper disease arises again. 1980, the conservator. So it's clear what's happened the conservator surgically 
eradicated <laughs> the paper. So that's the conservation after 1980. And at your right, the one I did in 2010, already 10 years ago. So there was not uh, much for me to do. I could extend the cover, but there was no point that I did anything on the folios if I could not recover the text. No, so I just added a um, foam uh, thing like the levels on a 3D map so that when the book was closed, um, they wouldn't uh, get tattered or wrinkled much. But whatever had been in this book before 1980, we cannot know because it's gone. So clearly what we remove is not reversible. And this is the third and last study case, but uh, I mean, be patient because this was like a thesis for this conservator and it gathers a compendium of all sorts of conservation treatments. This book was a, an oversized book, almost uh, 70 centimeters high with beautiful engravings. And uh, the, I could see the inks were sort of blurred. And uh, taking a closer look, there was a powder on all the folios that I thought it might have been talcum because it looked like softer than, than calcium. So I could remove that with, um, well, with a dry cleaning, no? And well, later on I did a, a wet cleaning as well. So again, whatever is added, even if it's mm, not much useful, can be reverted. Um, there were other interventions in this book. Uh, you see these um, tiny little spots. If we look at it much closer, we see that they, they all had like a tight line, like a stain, and also a, a pencil mark on most of them. And we read, uh, you see the tight line, and well, on many of them, you see the one on the bottom, on your right, uh, there is a, a hole, a, a, a hole. So, we got these messages from the previous conservator attached on, on the book. And that was really useful to understand what happened. It says, some pages have dark spots, which after time hollow the paper. That demonstrates how serious this issue is. I have tried several solvents in vain. So with the solvents, now we know uh, that What's the cause of these uh, little tight lines? Would it be convenient to burn the spots to prevent them from becoming bigger? <laughs> so this was in 1990, and apparently uh, for some years he had been following the evolution of the book because in 95 uh, he is watching that the stain does not go beyond the circle of, that he made. But it seems clear that these holes were intended uh, because this hole, I mean, looks intended. This is not a foxing hole. So he, he just did that. He just removed, eradicated every foxing spot. We don't have any more foxing we have many stains <laughs> because some of the stains I honestly could not remove. I, I do not really know what are they. And as for the holes, uh, well, of course, we can infill them, but I don't know if, uh, I mean, they are really small, so maybe there's no point to do it. Still, other conservation treatments. And now I go, uh, because we have seen what we add and what we remove, but I want to focus as well on what we change, the chemical aspects. 
And apparently, although it didn't say anywhere, the papers were bleached. You could see because it's uh, much whiter and also because the paper was uh, very, very damaged and brittle and yeah, I mean, in a really poor condition. And this is why I decided to wash all the paper to remove uh, bleach remnants from the paper. So at some point we can, yeah, I can remove the remnant, but I cannot go backwards and unbleach what was bleach. And I can only reinforce the tears that had already taken place. And oh, surprise, I'm sure most of you were waiting for the pressure sensitive tapes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There are pressure sensitive tapes and uh, you know about them. We can remove the, the tape itself, the plastic, but oxidation is not that easily reverted because if it has taken place for some years, mm, there has been an oxidation and that is not that reversible. So chemical damage, uh, I mean, it's really not easy to revert. Good, so we have seen all these examples and uh, well, as a general conclusion, it's clear that whatever we remove is the most irreversible. Cleaning, wet cleaning, dry cleaning, surface cleaning, stain removal, all these things are not reversible. Still, uh, I don't think we should not uh, do not reversible treatments. And on the very right, you have an example of the uh, paper swaps I removed uh, while removing the varnish from the map. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that for the fact that you remove something, you, you should not do it. I mean, I'm just saying that removal is not reversible. And if we replace, we are removing as well. I mean, we remove whatever and we add something in return. Whatever we add is more reversible, but again, it doesn't mean that it's good because it's reversible. And I go to the example of the varnished book. Yeah, I mean, it's reversible, but what's the point? <laughs> It's causing damage. So uh, we should pay major attention as well to less reversible, uh, to, to more uh, reversible treatments because it doesn't mean that because it's reversible, it's good. No. And we should always uh, be cautious and do the least we can. And uh, there is this last. Uh, variation on what we do in conservation, which is modifying any chemical change when we are chemical or also structural, because sometimes we change the, the, the sewing of a book, no, in terms of uh, gaining stability or, or whatever. So these modifications are uh, the acidification, chelation, chelators, phytate, uh, Lead white, I mean, all these things, we know they are not reversible. I mean, in practical terms, they are not. And still, I mean, we, we do them, no? And I mean, when they put the tape, yeah, I mean, we can remove the tape, but it's not really reversible. So uh, up to here, we have seen uh, <laughs> all the examples. In conclusion, is reversibility a guarantee for a good conservation? No. Fortunately, fortunately, it's not because it does not exist. <laughs> so we would have a problem if that was the guarantee. And also because it's a very elusive uh, concept. I mean, we, we cannot really know to which extent we need to go uh, in time or... But uh, we need to seek for it anyway, 
without making it our unique goal. Our goal should be to achieve the object, to, be, uh, to make it stable, functional, and readable. And by readable, I mean that uh, the information it spreads is consistent, it's understandable, it's, uh, yeah, and it's not a weird thing. In, in, in order to, to achieve these goals, the, the, and these and, and other goals, um, there is a decision-making required. Because as you could see with the, with the repairs of, uh, that I chose not to attach again, I mean, no matter what I do, there is always uh, something that is left aside. So either I choose to make the object more stable or not, or I choose to be more strict in the historical fidelity, but I cannot really have the two at the same time. I mean, th there is always a, a decision-making involved in it, and we are the ones to do it. However, this decision-making, the fact that 100% uh, reversibility does not exist, shouldn't prevent us from <laughs> doing our jobs the best we can. Because we have the knowledge, we have the skills, and we have the experience. So I think that uh, what we should do is um, help uh, future generations to come by doing excellent and fantastic condition reports because they might not probably share <laughs> our decisions but they will very much appreciate what we did with which products and and how we did it so uh, as a summary i think that since we cannot be 100% reversible, and there is so much uh, subjective decision-making involved in it, we should be the 100% or <laughs> the most responsible and accountable for what we do in conservation. Thank you all. I hope uh, you enjoyed it, and I'm happy to reply to any question. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much. I think um, we do have a few questions. So with your permission, I'll take those. OK, the first question. Please let me know the adhesive used for lining the paper affected by the iron gall ink. What, what adhesive was used for lining the iron gall ink damaged paper? I used a mixture of uh, methyl cellulose and starch paste. Thank you. Uh, what is used uh, to fix the ink? What is used by you to fix the ink? And do you think fixing of ink is a reversible process? I don't think I fixed any of the inks of uh, what you have seen. None of the objects had any of the inks fixed. I try to avoid that, fixing inks, because it uh, has the inconvenience that if you intend to do a wet treatment afterwards, then the wet treatment is as, not as effective. So I only do wet treatments when I can, and I usually do not fix uh, the inks. I'm, I mean, I do sometimes, but rarely. But if you have to, if I have to, well, I sometimes use um, cyclododecan or uh, paraloid. I use paraloid, um, for instance, in in parchment whenever I have to do a, a wet or moist treatment on it, because then it's really easy to remove afterwards. And I use cyclododecan because it uh, goes away on its own. Thank you. Is 
is regarding the book that Taryn called damage book treatment that you did. Did you have to disbind the iron gold yeah. treatment? And was this an extra consideration for you before treatment? Did you take care of probably the binding and then you had to probably rebind it also? So was this something yeah. that, uh, you took extra care of? That's the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, Well, I made a thorough uh, report of the collation to leave everything as it was. And the binding that was quite damaged as well. I don't know if I added the link, but this particular book you can find on the portfolio on, of my website. And you see the, the binding and the folios. Yeah, yeah, I did a, a really intensive treatment. I dismantled the book, uh, washed the folios, lined the folios, did a new sewing and bound the book again, but uh, reusing the, the original covers. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, is it common to retouch paper for aesthetic reasons where the oxidation or the stainings cannot be removed? So would you retouch the stains in that case to just make them you know, less visible or more aesthetically appealing? Mm, it's not common, but uh, I do it sometimes. <laughs> For instance, I have a, a print now that it had a really mm, strong stain, but the stain was um, like a revert stain. So all the document was really dark except for the middle part where there, there had been some glue. So that glue had prevented that area from oxidation. So I washed, I mean, I tried to diminish this contrast by well, regular treatments, uh, washing, uh, deacidification. I think I also did like bleaching and it diminished but it didn't go away completely. So at the end, the part that was uh, paler, I applied some watercolor because that was a print and the owner, I mean, wants to have the print and admire it. So <laughs> it has to look nice. I'm not saying you should do this always and I don't do it, but sometimes I do it, yes. I think uh, those are the questions. I don't see any more. If there are any questions, please do type them so that we get to see them. No. Sorry? No more questions. Okay, then we have a question. We have one question. It says, what is your experience of using phytate to deacidify paper affected by iron galling? Have you ever used that? Uh, yeah. My experience, oh, do you see me? Yeah, no? I see you. So, um, yeah, I, I did the phytate treatment with a musical score. Mm. And yeah, I, I must say I did not, uh, I wasn't really happy with the result. I mean, the result is, I mean, chemically it sure works. I mean, you stop oxidation. But what I could see is that only with a washing, with a regular washing, if I do the iron uh, test first, and I do the iron test after a tap water washing, uh, most of it had gone away, all the iron. Uh, so, mm, I think that if the folio is super, super damaged in a very bad con condition, maybe it's not worth to make it go through mm. lots of months and lots of, I mean, you have to be extremely careful. So if you just reduce a big part of the iron with a regular wash, mm, I mean, if you are rich and you want to spend uh, thousands and thousands of euros on the book, 
okay, no problem. <laughs> but if you have many books with iron galleons, uh, maybe, mm, yeah, you can just wash and it's quite effective as well. So, yeah, I was a bit disappointed in the practical application of it because if you apply it on a folio that is horribly damaged, uh, it doesn't seem reasonable that you uh, wash it uh, three, four, five times. Thank you. The next question is about the purple cancer that you mentioned. According to you, what was the purple, ca purple cancer the conservator may have observed in the case study you mentioned? I, I guess it was just mold. I guess it was mold stains. I mean, I, I had never heard of it here. I mean, I don't know where, where he took it from. <laughs> I guess it was just that, just purple stains of mold. Mm, they are quite common, yes. Thank you. The next question is, what type of water you prefer for washing the paper deionized, distilled, or regular tap? And why? What is your preference and why? Well, um, there are several factors. So from one side, the time you have and the, the resources, so how much money you have to spend on that object. And I mean, if, if the object is not very damaged and a simple tap water is enough, I mean, I use tap water all the time. But for some cases, uh, deionized water is far much effective as a cleaning agent because it has no, no other ions in there. But precisely because of that, mm, you should also be quite cautious because you don't want to use deionized water and remove uh, no, and, and do a, a cleaning that maybe is not necessary. So I use both and it depends on, on what case. No? Uh, usually, I mean, whenever I use distilled water, at the end, I do a tap water wash because you, I don't want the paper to be so uh, willing to absorb whatever. I think it's better to leave it in a way that it doesn't absorb so many other pollutants, for instance, or whatever. Thank you. The question is, what machine or technique would you use to verify different inks used? So can you differentiate between iron gall, carbon, or printed ink? How would you differentiate between these kind of inks? How would, I mean, distinguish? How can I see the difference? Yeah, whether it's iron gall, carbon, or printing. I know. I think you can see um, at night eye, no? And if you are not sure, I mean, at some point, no, maybe you are looking and you are not sure whether it's a carbon or it's a lithography, you know? <laughs> if you are not sure, you can just do a test, no? You check with a, on a tiny spot with some water or or just scrape a bit, but usually in, you can tell by looking at it. And also, I think the date of the book would also give you an idea whether it's iron gall or printed ink. If it's it's sorry, old. I said the date of the book. The book's uh, date of would also give you an idea whether it could be iron gall or printed ink. I mean, one doesn't expect old books maybe to have printing and new books to have iron calling. Maybe that's another way. Yeah, but the, the aspect is the most, uh, no, the better information. I mean, you, you see that. See. Visual examination is the best technique. Uh, no more questions? I think that's about it. Thank you so much, Rita, for a lovely presentation. I think most of us would be thinking about reversibility and irreversibility. And thank you for a very practical approach to it. I think that was the best part of uh, the lecture, the complete unapologetic approach to being 
irreversible as conservators and not even claiming to be completely reversible. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow at five o'clock. We have another talk. Please do join us. It's Louis Bradley tomorrow talking about mounting of paper objects. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you, everyone.